there are two most fundamental things in life that every one of us in this room will either get right or we won't. The two, the two most fundamental things in life that, that you and I will either get right and, and it will be, it will, it will have a blessed life or we will miss, we will get wrong and we will live a tragic life. I'm going to tell you what those two things are. I don't think anyone will disagree. Uh, the two things are love and God. And how we deal with both of these topics really sets the course for our lives. How you deal with, with love um, as it relates to your family, as it relates to your spouse, as it relates to your children, as it relates to your friends, uh, you'll either get it right and it will be a blessing or you will, you'll miss the mark and you will experience the consequences. And as it relates to God, a fundamental aspect of life, how you deal with God, it will either set a blessed course for your life or a tragic course. Two most fundamental things in life that we either get right or we don't, love and God. This is the statement that Jesus made that we've been camping out on. This is the third week, and we'll look at this, uh, this same statement every week uh, until we finish this, this sermon series, Community Matters. This, this quote by Jesus comes out of John chapter 13. He said to his disciples, and he says to us today as a church, he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The words of Jesus. And what jumps out at me at this, uh, every time I read this passage, again today, it jumps out at me. It, not the redundancy, although that is true. Jesus keeps saying the same thing. But, but what jumps out at me is the fact that he says this is a new commandment. I don't know, I don't quite know why he calls it a new commandment, but I have some ideas that I want to share with you today. What I do know is he doesn't mean this is a new commandment in the sense that, that the Jews in the Old Testament weren't required to love one another, but, but now they are. Not a new commandment in that sense. So what does he mean when he says a new commandment? Jesus uses that phrase, a new commandment, and interestingly, one of his disciples, John, uses that phrase as well. We're going to look at that today. Now, I want to remind you who John is. John the disciple, John the beloved. This is not John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a good man. Some church tradition says that John the disciple was actually a disciple of John the Baptist, and then he was one of those disciples that left John the Baptist to follow after Jesus, and John the Baptist blessed that. We don't know that for sure. Church history says that. But John, the disciple, is uh, the author of, of a letter that we're going to be camping out, on, uh, camping out on today. John, the disciple. Remember, he was uh, most likely the youngest of the 12 apostles. Because he was young, probably younger than Jesus, he outlived Jesus by 50 or more years he most likely finished his days out on this island where he wrote the book of Revelation. But, but, but what I told you regarding John last week is that, that the church tradition tells us that he got so old and so decrepit that he would be carry, he, he, the, the younger man would carry him around Ephesus and he would, he would visit the different churches as an old, old man. And he, he simply had the strength to say, Dear children, love one another. Dear children, love one another. One another. Words that he heard Jesus say, these last words that, Je that he heard Jesus say before Jesus went to the cross. Love one another. 
uh, John, the disciple whose letter we're studying today, uh, initially he and his brother had this nickname. You remember what it was? It was Sons of Thunder. It sounds like a, like a NASCAR name or it sounds like a, a professional wrestling nickname. They were, they were called Sons of Thunder. We don't know exactly why uh, Jesus called them Sons of Thunder, but I'm sure Jesus knew exactly what he meant. But Jesus changed, actually Scripture changes John, the disciple's um, title, or, or nickname rather, what he eventually becomes known as, um, he's, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. It, it's, it's, it's quite evident that, that John, the disciple, was Jesus' closest confidant, his, his dearest friend. This is the disciple whom Jesus said, John, behold your mother. Um, Mother, behold your son. And he passed his mother on to his dearest friend. And he passed his dearest friend on to now be the son of his mother because he knew he was going to ascend into heaven. This is the John that we read today. John who wrote uh, five books of the Bible. The Gospel of John. First, second, and third John. And the book of Revelation. This is John the disciple, the beloved apostle. He writes this letter, and we're going to look at first, uh, first John today, and it's all about love. Jesus' closest confidant, and he writes the letter, and it's all about love. Again, there are two most important things in life, and if you get them right, you live a blessed life. One is love, and the other is God. 1 John chapter 2, the writings of this John the Apostle, the beloved disciple. You read along silently while I read out loud. It says, by this we know that we are in him, that we are in Christ, is what, what he's saying. We're picking up, we're picking up uh, a little ways into the second chapter. By this we may know that we are in Christ. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked. Here's what John's saying. So, so if you're wondering, am I in? I know so many Christians, uh, it's a very common question to ask. You've probably asked, I've probably asked, or I have asked this question of myself. Is my faith authentic? Meaning, am I really a Christian? Maybe you've wrestled with that. Maybe you've struggled with that. Most of us do. Most of us ask that question. Am I in? Am I in Christ? Or am I apostate? Am I outside of? Am I not a child of God? And so, so, so John the disciple says, if you're wondering, am I in Christ? John says, the way to know that, that he abides in you or, or, or that you, you abide in him, the way to know is, look at your life, do you keep pace with Jesus? Are you, is, is the way you walk and the way you talk and the way you look and the way you live, does it emulate Jesus? And you say, well, how did Jesus uh, walk and talk and look? Well, all you have to do is read the Gospels because that is a record of how Jesus lived. We, we read the Gospels and say, Jesus is way up here, which he is. He's God. Uh, I can never be like him. But what we miss sometimes is that is the whole point of Christianity is to become like him. <clears throat> So if you keep pace, you carry yourself the way Jesus carried yourself, his, himself, that is the metric, the, the ruler, the yardstick, the test that John gives us. If you're wondering if you abide in Christ, here's the test. Here's the metric. It's, very, it's a very different metric uh, from the metric that we often hear coming out of the church. Especially, especially the Bible Belt Christianity of the last 75 years. 
it, it, what's, what's really developed in the church and in the Protestant church and, and those of us that hold to Baptist distinctives in the Baptist church, what, what, is, what is really uh, developed over the last 75 years is a very different metric in which we, we, we would say we are in Christ if we staunchly hold to a set of beliefs. And you remember from a, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Jesus said, blessed are you um, if you do what I've said. Not if you know what I've said. He said, if you understand what I've said here, blessed are you if you do them. So, 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 so the apostle, uh, John the disciple, he gives us this metric. This yardstick, which we can, we can measure, determine, am I in Christ? <clears throat> um, going on with uh, the disciples' letter. This is rather wordy. Listen closely. It's, it's, it's not, it's not compl complicated, but it is a bit wordy. Sorry, verse 7. This is again John the disciples writing. <laughs> Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment. Okay, wait, he, he seems to be contradicting what Jesus said. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Verse 8. At the same time, at the same time, it, it is a new commandment that I am writing you, which is true in, in Christ and is true in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. What is the opposite of love? It's hate, right? The opposite of love is hate. Whoever says he is... Uh, in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Okay, so now John is using the same speech. He's saying, like, this is a new commandment. Okay, it's not like it's an age-old commandment. We are to love one another. But, but on the other hand, it's a new commandment. And what is he saying? Or why is he saying that? Here's what I believe is going on here. I believe Jesus in saying, a new commandment I give to you. And John the, and John the disciple saying, yeah, it's kind of a new commandment. I think what they're talking about is the cross. I think what they're saying is, Jesus is saying, I'm about to go to the cross, and, and love is going to explode exponentially. And you will have the capacity to love like never before, because I am about to... Uh, execute the most loving act I possibly could on the cross, the Holy Spirit will come and now you will be able to love infinitely greater than you ever have loved before. And I believe that John is saying the same thing. He says, love has always been here. It's an old commandment that we love, love one another, but Jesus just went to the cross. He just defeated death and he just now ushered in a new era. <clears throat> a new covenant. A new a new day. We can now love like we've never loved before. In that sense, it's a new commandment. It's like, it's like a greater capacity to love than we've ever had before as children of God. That's what I think they're saying. Again, here in this passage, there is this tension. There's this tension. John is saying... If you are a believer, you're in Christ, and yet your life is not marked by love, then it's marked by hate. And John is saying, if, you're, if your life is not marked by love, you should rethink what it means to be a believer. Whoever says he is in the light, and yet his life is still marred by hate and animosity, and aggression is actually not living in the light at all. He's living in the darkness. 
Skipping a few verses now. John contrasts loving one another and loving the things of the world, interestingly. The world's ways. Now, as we get ready to read this passage, what do I... The world's ways, the world's things in contrast to the things of God, the things of eternity. I'll explain that a little bit more here in just a second, but let's, let's read on. John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see how he's contrasting these two. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So practically speaking, in other words, this isn't like deep theological talk. What I'm about to say, it, I think it's fairly easy to understand. Practically speaking, most everything that goes on in this world, the world outside these four walls, or however many walls we have, uh, outside these four walls, um, it's, it's, it's about a very different sort of economy. It's not God's economy. It's not an eternal perspective. But pretty much everything that goes on outside of these walls, it's a very different perspective. It's a very different economy. It's a very different value system. And, and, and what John, in his words here, talking about the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, Basically, everything that goes on in the world outside, it's about, it's about wanting. It's about, it's, about, uh, it's about the desire to be the most important. It's about the, the dog-eat-dog dog sort of approach to life. It's about the competitive nature of the human spirit. It's about wanting our own way and getting my own way and rugged individualism. The desire to be the most important person. And John is setting this up here, this, this contrast. He, he's setting it up to say that those ways, the ways of the world, that is the antithesis, the opposite of everything that Jesus stood for in his life. So if you live that life, the wanting and the, 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 the rugged individualism and the dog-eat-dog -dog sort of approach to life, which I have dabbled in myself. The person who has a, a particularly fond affection for capitalism, for instance. What, 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 what John is saying, that whole world is really the antithesis, the opposite of how Jesus rolled, of, of how he lived his life, of all the, the values that he seemed to, uh, to hold up. The gospel. I mean, that creates some incredible tension in my own life. Because remember, uh, John said the, the metric to determine whether or not you're a Christ follower is do you look like him? Do you act like him? Do you hold to the values that he holds to? Let's finish our reading for today by skipping ahead to, to chapter 3 actually. John says, John the disciple says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Again, this whole book, this whole letter, first, first John is, is about loving one another. And then verse 12, we should not be like Cain. Now, remember Cain and Abel, they were Adam and Eve's uh, first two sons. And we should ask one another, um, 
Like, why is he bringing up Cain? Like, that's really odd. But Cain is a symbol. Cain represents something. We'll see what that is here in a minute. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Why did he murder Abel? Because, though, because his own deeds were evil and his brother's deeds were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. And what he means by that is the world doesn't get you. The world uh, pushes against all that you hold to as dear. The world hates you in the sense that it, it, uh, it marginalizes you. It says that your vision, your values don't really matter. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life. We're now eternal beings because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We're going to read on, but... But, uh, but let me point out, now you see why Cain has been mentioned. Because Cain hated his brother, his, his, his actual biological brother. Some of us, we hate our brothers and sisters in Christ. We neglect, we ignore, we mistreat, we hate one another. All of this love that we're talking about here today is about our love for one another in the church. That's the whole point. He's saying, don't be like Cain. Cain hated his brother. And he was of the evil one. Verse 16. By this we know love. That Jesus, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and the sisters, for the church. That's what he's saying. But if anyone has the world's goods, some of us got the goods, some of us don't got the goods. Anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does, how does God's love abide in him? Little children... Let us uh, not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. <laughs> so what's going on here? There's really, there's, there's really like four different, like John lays a foundation and then like three more layers. Basically what he's saying is, Number one, be like Jesus. Like if, you, if you want to abide in Christ, if you want to consider yourself a, 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 a Christian, a Christ follower, if you want to, to have this sense of security that you, you have a home in heaven with the Father for eternity, then be like Christ, which means more than just like gutting it out, willpower. In fact, it doesn't mean that at all. It means coming under submission to the Lordship of Christ. Be like Christ. And then very clearly what he says is, don't be like the world. In other words, in other words, everyone else that isn't in Christ, don't be like them. <clears throat> and then he, 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 said, he goes on, kind of building on this foundation. He says, I can't read my own writing here. Hold on. Hate, the absence of love, is evidence that you are not in Christ. That you, are, that you are not a child of God. In contrast to that, love, the absence of hate, is clear evidence that you are in Christ. So according to 1 John, the greatest threat to your love for one another 
is your love for the world. Let me say that again. According to what we've just read, the greatest threat to your love for one another is your love for another. For the world. Everything that goes on outside of these four walls pulls you apart. Pulls us away from one another. Robs us of our love for one another because it <clears throat> it stirs in us an affection for other things. For stuff. Think on that. Everything that draws you away that says, I don't want to go to community. I don't want to be in community. I want, to, I want to live outside of community. What is it? It's the love of the world. Everything that draws you away and says, I don't want to share my stuff. I want to keep my stuff. It's the love of the world. And, 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 and John here is saying very clearly, the one great threat to your love for one another is your love for the world. Which at the heart, at the root, is a selfish sort of love for rugged individualism. And it leads to all sorts of trappings and, and, and the excessive entertainment and, 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 and the allure, uh, the esteem of, of attention and the pull and the tug of the world that every human being that walks this globe feels. So when we're that way, we're no different than anyone else. We're like everyone else. It's the path of least resistance. But the high watermark that Jesus has, 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 has laid for us in this passage that I really want to spend the rest of our time on today, the high watermark, I want to camp out on this today. Why does Jesus say this love will draw others, those outside of the church, to us. Why does Jesus say that, it will, that, that, that our love for one another in the church will capture the attention of the unbeliever? He says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you now love one another. You 12 men, you're all you've got. I'm about to go away you're all you've got. You love one another. And by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. There will be this, this gravitational pull. There will, there will be this attractiveness, uh, this allure, this attention will be drawn when the church actually gets, about, gets to the business of loving one another. How does that happen? How can I love in a way that unbelievers are drawn to the faith? They want to be Christians too. How, how can I do that? How can we do that? And first, by way of review, um, this, isn't, uh, this isn't new material here, but we've slept seven times since last Sunday. So let me just remind you, we talked about if we're going to love one another, if I'm going to love you well as your pastor, and you're going to love each other well, as brothers and sisters in Christ, <clears throat> then, then it's, going to, it's going to be really in three steps. Number one, we are going to humble ourselves. Number two, we're going to make time for one another. And number three, we're going to inconvenience ourselves. <clears throat> if, if our love for one another is going to be so evident to everyone else in Brownsville, it's going to be so intoxicating that others are going to be drawn to the church because of it, it's going to look like this. We're going to, number one, humble ourselves. Your friend who's on the outside of the church, in fact, all of your friends who are outside of the church, do you know how impressed they are with humility? In a day and an age and an era in a society where humility is, is, is uh, it's hard to find. It's becoming scarce. 
even among Christians. Maybe I should say especially among Christians. We live in an era, we live in a society in which humility is scarce. But your friends, they, are, they continue to be, in fact, even now more than ever, impressed with humility. Because all they ever see is the opposite. And making time for one another. Stopping, slowing down, making time. Th those, those who are outside of the church, they're blown away when someone um, gives away their time. Because our time, it's our most precious commodity. We may love our money more, but actually our time it's probably our most precious commodity. Probably many of us have more money than we have time. We're just super busy people. But when someone makes time for someone else, and I'm talking about in the church. I'm not talking about making time for people out there. That's great, and Jesus calls us to, to that too. But when we make time for one another, people are impressed. Because we're... Basically, we're money rich and we're time poor. We don't have a lot of excess time to give away. So busy always. Too busy often to give our time to one another in the church. Some of you, I know this. Not, not all of you, but some of you, I, I know this because you've told me. Your friends ask you, man, why do you spend so much time at church? I told a story a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, at our first community night, the very first one, about John and Simon. Most of you heard this story. There's the final chapter in that story, but the few of you that, weren't, that haven't been here on Wednesday nights, let me just give you a, a quick, quick overview. John and Simon are work uh, acquaintances, and, and John... Can you click that for there? Oop. John and Simon are work acquaintances. And uh, John is uh, a Christian. He, and he's very involved in his church. And Simon is not a Christian and doesn't go to any church. And they have a, rocket, a racquetball game. And John uh, pelts Simon in the back of the leg with a, with a racquetball. And it leaves a mark. Uh, if you ever played racquetball, you know where that goes. Uh, and then they spend a little more time together, and John's feeling a little bad about that. One thing leads to another, and John says, look, why don't you come go with? Like, I got a party, a uh, barbecue uh, at a friend of mine's, uh, at my friend's house in a few weeks. Why don't you come with me? And Simon's a little reluctant. He's like, I won't know anybody. But, but John eventually gets Simon to come to this party and Simon comes to the party and he's really liking it. He's really digging all of John's friends. But then, high alert, uh, Simon realizes, wait a minute, like everybody here is talking about Jesus. Like everybody here goes to church. And so he's a little wigged out by that. But, but mostly he's just intrigued by the fact that these are super generous people and these are super kind people and they, they love one another. And he's like, I don't know about Jesus, but I do know about these people and I really, I really dig them. Um, so that, that's where we left off last time uh, on Wednesday night. I'm going to read you the final uh, the final chapter, not an entire chapter, that would take a long time, but uh, the final sort of uh, entry in this little story, this total church, Steve Timmis, Tim Chester, and it says, John was pleased to hear Simon's voice at the other end of the phone. He was even more pleased to learn that Simon had spent the previous day with John's friends from church. Remember, Simon didn't go to church. But even that didn't prepare John for what Simon was about to tell him. Um, here's what Simon says. Uh, Simon says, uh, I, I did that on Wednesday too. Yeah. Um, Simon says, I got into a, a bit of a heavy conversation with 
Jake and Tracy, John's friends. Wasn't sure what to make of it at, at, uh, at the start, but their answers to my question, questions made some sort of sense, I guess. The hardest thing to argue with is the kind, the kind of lives you guys all live. I've never seen anything like it, so I hope you don't mind, but I've agreed to start looking at the Bibles with, with them for a couple of hours. Mind? John was out of his mind with, with joy, with excitement, that Simon was beginning to take interest, not just in his friends, but now in Jesus. If, if, if we're going to love one another uh, with this kind of love that Jesus says will be attractive and, and intoxicating to those around us, our love is going to be marked by humility, by making time for one another, and by inconveniencing ourselves. Y your friends take notice when a person inconveniences himself. I mean, he does it voluntarily. It's one thing when a politician shows up for 20 minutes, uh, a photo shoot after Hurricane Harvey, and then, and then takes off. You know, it, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it super uh, non-convincing when you see a politician there working a Hurricane Harvey thing, and he, he's got like his, his tie on and like his white shirt rolled up? Like, like that's not, those aren't work clothes. You're just there for the shoot. But, but when people truly inconvenient, when the church inconveniences ourselves for one another. When you take time off work to serve one another. When you don't go to softball practice because you, you have a choir rehearsal. We don't have choir here. But, but to, to come to community night. People say that's different. That's a little weird. But it's attractive. So I'm going to give you three behaviors that you should take on right now. If you want to be about the work of evangelism in the life of your friends, I'm going to give you three behaviors. You see, we think that, that, that in order to, to be evangelists, in order to tell people about Jesus, which we, we have some sense of obligation like I think I'm supposed to, which is not a really good motivator, right? Obligation, but, but we have this sense of obligation, but then, we're, but then we have this fear. I think we have the idea that somehow in order to fulfill that, you, you have to take a deep breath and for 20 uninterrupted moments share, you know, like 15 truths from the gospel. Or maybe you think evangelism means that you have to argue with your friends don't do that. In fact, I would contend that is the most unloving approach to evangelism possible. And arrogant. But, but, but three behaviors. Three behaviors. Every Christian should consider. Number one, real simple. Let people know you go to church. Do you do that? They're like, yeah, you know, I go to church. You know, Sunday, you know, watch the Cowboys uh, the, the, on Sunday. Well, I'm probably going to miss the, the, the beginning of the game because I go to church. Go to River Church, and I go to church, and I go. Do you do, you do that? That'd be the, that'd be a real simple first behavior in 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 giving people a, a window, a little picture into your life and our love for one another. Number two, let people know you're a Christian. And then it means something to you. Let them know you're a Christian and then it means something to you. Maybe you're struggling through something that a co-worker is struggling through. Maybe, maybe you're struggling uh, through some marital problems. And maybe a, a lady at work, you're a lady and another lady at work, she's struggling with the same, you know, maybe your husband and her husband are like cut from the same cloth, right? And, and so you're, you're struggling through that together and you're, you're in, a, in an esteeming way. You're sharing with one another your struggles. And maybe you'd say something like this. You know, my faith really informs my decisions about my marriage. In, in this season of my life, my faith really informs my decisions. 
then people realize, oh, so, so this person uh, is a Christian and it, it means something to him. It means something to her. And then the last behavior, real simple. Invite, invite people to join your group of friends. It's the come go with factor that I have spoken of before. I want to invite Amanda and Jenny Stumbaugh to come up here. And uh, just briefly, Amanda, I'm going to ask Amanda a few questions. And, and Jenny is her friend, so Jenny's going to stand here with her. Can you stand by this, behind this microphone? Say something, we'll make sure it's working. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right. And stand, stand fairly close. Okay. All right. This is Amanda Ellis, and I had the privilege of baptizing you how long ago? A little over a year. Okay, yeah. So I have three questions. Question number one, have you ever been an active part of any other church in your life? Well, the short and simple answer is no. Um, I grew up in what I would call a technically Catholic family. Um, but I did not go to church um, with my parents. I would usually attend if I spent the night um, at a friend's house on a Saturday night. And I just never really felt uh, comfortable or welcome at a church before, um, especially going to a Catholic church that had a lot of rituals and things that I didn't understand, um, not being allowed to be a part of communion. So as I got older and older, anytime I went, I just got further and further to the back. Even as I became an adult and started attending weddings, I would be the person who sat all the way in the back, so it wasn't obvious that I wasn't um, going and partaking in those things. Yeah. Question two. Why did you come to River Church the, the first time that you came? Um, specifically, River Church is because Jenny invited me, but I would also say that's why I started coming to church in general. Um, I was going through a really hard time in my life. Basically, everything had fallen apart, and I was at work one day, and I, in the summer, I actually asked to go home and leave early, and I told her that I was completely broken, and she texted me back saying, without him, we are all broken. And we started talking about going to church, and um, she knew that I was kind of scared and how I um, felt about organized religion as a whole. And so she suggested some places that uh, she thought I would like and that she offered to go to other places with me even if it wasn't River Church. But we ended up coming here. The first day I came was actually um, the first day of the Gladness series, um, talking about finding joy and gladness in God. And I remember sitting next to her and I basically just bawled the entire time. And I told Randy that he could have written that sermon for me and I've been coming back ever since. Last question. Why did you eventually decide to be baptized? Um, I started keeping a prayer journal. And one day at night, I was at my parents' house um, in bed between my two boys, because that's where we were living. And I wrote a letter to God, um, basically asking God to come into my heart and find me. Uh, Randy kept talking about how God wants to find you and wants to have a relationship with you. And as cheesy as it sounds, I woke up feeling better and just kept feeling more and more of God and Jesus in my heart after that. Um, and after studying the Bible and reading more, I just really um, felt a connection to Jesus. And I had always thought I wasn't good enough um, but learning that Jesus loved everybody, and including the sinners, which is me, um, I felt like I wanted everyone to know that change in my heart, and um, so I asked Randy to baptize me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
to let them know I miss you. Thank you. Thank you, dear. I probably shouldn't preach. We probably should just do this every week. Um, listen to this statement. People are willing to belong often long before they're willing to believe. And I'm really okay with that. You have a lot of friends. You have a number of friends who are who, who desire to belong to a loving group of people. And they are, they are right now in their lives more willing to belong than they are to believe. And of course they would like to join a group of people who are humble. And a group of people who are giving of their time. And a, a group of people who are willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of someone else's needs. And <clears throat> Amanda saw that in, in Jenny's life and, and you heard the rest of the story. I, I've said, I've said that, that I'm, I'm on this mission in this, in this sermon series to create for us a new culture, that, that this would be a culture shifting sort of a, of a series uh, in, 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 for us as a church. And, and, and that is the, the culture shift that I pray for. That is the culture shift that I long for. That we would be a people of humility and a, and a people who make time and inconvenience ourselves for one another so that others might, might find it attractive. They might find it appealing. They might determine that's, that's something I want. May that be if that's if that's what you want for us as a church, if that's what you want for your life as an individual, then, then keep coming back and, 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 and join us Wednesday night. And we're going to be talking even more practically on Wednesday night about how that looks. The nuts and bolts of how you invite someone into your life and into your community of faith. Let's pray.